And, and it's something that I can definitely relate to them because I do expert witness work. That's one of our several lines of business at Secure Anchor. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of Life of a CISO. If this is the first time dialing in, I want to wish you a warm welcome. We're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about cybersecurity strategy. But if this is your first time listening, I have one question for you. Where have you been? Right? We've been waiting for you. Right? We, we're going on uh, over our 30th episode. Uh, just because there's so much that goes on in cybersecurity, we do this weekly. So definitely get caught up. We have some great episodes. For those of you that are returning, welcome back. And thank you for trusting me with 30 plus minutes of your time where we get to talk about cybersecurity and cybersecurity strategy. Before we get in to today where I wanna really just clarify the role of a CISO, because I find with a lot of the people I've been talking with and coaching and on my programs, is there's still a fundamental misunderstanding of what exactly the role of a CISO is. So I, I really wanna break that down, but before just two announcements, because I've been getting a lot of questions on it. Yes, 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 against my better judgment. Uh, I've written another book, Cyber Crisis. So if you go to cybercrisisbook.com, I definitely wanna pre-order that. It's coming out in May. But uh, if you understand books, they do a, an initial print order and that usually gets sold out. So whoever orders first gets that. So you definitely wanna go in and get your copy of Cyber Crisis. This is really written from a business perspective. And it's exactly the mindset of a CISO or executives in your organization. So if you're reading this book, it's a really great test because I got some pre-release versions and I had a friend of mine reading and he goes, Eric, I think the book's really good, but it's not technical enough. You don't really get into the technical details and the technical information like you do in Network Security Bible. And I looked at him and I smiled and I said with love in my heart, and if you know me, that means I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some, some tough feedback, right, that you might not wanna hear. I said, so with love in my heart, I said, you're a world-class security engineer. I said, you are not, at least right now, today, you are not thinking like a CISO because the book is the level that a CISO needs to think about. It's the level they need to communicate with the executives about. So if you're one of those folks that you're a CISO, but you're struggling because you're too technical or you're technical and you want to get into a CISO, that's really where this book is going to help you because it's going to show you the mindset of executives. I've had many, many CEOs read it and their comments. And, and once again, I, I know with books and coming from me, you might think it's biased, but really with no prompting, I just gave them the book and said, what do you think? And they said, Eric, this is the first time I really understand cybersecurity. It's the first time I really understand what the threats and exposures are to the organization. So that's definitely a must read for you and your executives because the more that they can understand high level strategy and the more that you understand how to communicate with them, then you're gonna be in that win-win situation. So if we're going in and saying, what is the role of a CISO? then let's really break down what is cyber security? What is really the definition, the goal, the objectives when we play in this game, this exciting game of cyber security? And it's so funny because I, I just love it. I, I don't know what happened this year, but it's like everyone's getting on board. I always get one or two requests here or there about cybersecurity. But in the last few weeks, I've gotten seven different people that I know contact me and say, hey, Eric, my son or daughter is either in college, they're in high school, or they've been working, they're 24, 25, and they wanna get into cybersecurity. What do you think? What is your feedback? And I always love that, because I'm like, if you know me, I love, Cybersecurity. I mean, to, to me, it's the most amazing 
gift I've been ever given. The fact that when, when I was born and created, somebody decided this was Eric's purpose to make cyberspace safe. I consider myself so blessed. I mean, it's, it's the most exciting, wonderful field because you're always creating, solving, and most important, helping people be safe. So I'm always like, what do you think I'm going to say? No, or it sucks, right? I mean, it's it just to me an ironic question, but I'm like, oh, of course. And I, I love helping them. And I sort of give them a lot of feedback. And then it was the funniest thing. Four people in the gym that I work out, I exercise every single day. I exercise. And so you get to know people, right? right your gym crowd. And four of them came up to me like, hey, Hey, Eric, I know I've heard from some folks that you work in cyber. I'm thinking of moving into cybersecurity. Can you help me? It's like, of course. I don't, always willing to help a mentor. So it really seems like the visibility and focus is taking off that people are recognizing this is an amazing field. But what I always do with all of them, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean, <clears throat> but I always come back to them. I say, okay, I'm just curious. Right now, sitting here today, there's no right, no wrong answer. I said, in two years... When you get trained up, there will be a right or wrong answer, but right now there's not. What is the definition of cybersecurity? And they'll sort of look at me and go, what do you mean? It's like one of those terms, they know the term, they've heard the term, but it's like, how do you actually define it? And it's something that I can definitely relate to them because I do expert witness work. That's one of our several lines of business at Secure Anchor. And this week I had two depositions that I had to do. And in those depositions, they'll sort of ask you like definitions, what is a computer? Well, it's a computing device. No, no what is a computer? So, so I, I understand where these common terms are sometimes hard, but we really need to define that. So if we're really going sort of textbook, to me, when we're looking at cybersecurity, it's important to remember there's three things. So let, let's start really high level. So cybersecurity is about protecting an organization from digital risks. I don't want to use the word cyber or anything in the definition. So that's sort of highest level possible. And then if we drill down a little more, what we really get into is cybersecurity is about first, understanding, managing, and mitigating risk. Right, managing and mitigating risk. So that's the first part. Risk of what? Risk of your, your second part, critical data. What could happen to the critical data? Third part of your critical data being disclosed, altered, or denied access. So really our definition from a CISO perspective is what we're looking at is we're all about understanding, managing, and mitigating risk of the critical data to the organization being disclosed, altered, or denied access. So it's all about the impact to the business. And that's where the critical data comes into play. Because I always go in and ask, what is the difference between a major breach and a minor breach? And I'll initially go, oh, it's a trick question. There is no difference. It's actually not a trick question. There is. I always like using analogies. I find analogies are great because we're taking a concept we know and understand, and then we take that analogy, we can then apply it to a new area that we might not understand. So is there a difference between a major or a minor car accident? Absolutely. If you're sitting at a stoplight waiting for it to turn green, and the person behind you, and I kid you not, this didn't happen to me. It actually happened to the person next to me. I witnessed this. And the person behind you is doing a TikTok video, right? And they take their foot off the brake by accident and they roll into the back of your car. Boom. That's a minor car accident. Maybe there's a few little scratches. You maybe take the insurance information. But within 10 or 15 minutes, you're on your way. There's not really any injuries, any major impact. But what if you're going 80 miles an hour down the road and somebody sideswipes you and your car flips seven times and you have to get airlifted to the hospital? That is clearly a major car accident. And then I always go in and say, here's the important part. What is the difference? What is the difference 
between a major and a minor. The impact, to impact to who? You, right? Ultimately, the impact to you. Now, yes, we could argue that you could have accidents where the car has significant damage, but if you are perfectly fine, there's no scratches and no impact to you, then we would say that's, that's probably more on the minor side. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. So let's go back to our, what is the difference between a major breach and a minor breach? The data that's ultimately compromised. If somebody breaks into a server, even if they've gained full control of that server, and even if they're in that server for six months, if all they do is stay in the server and the server has no data, no information, and there's no impact to the organization, there's no fines, there's no regulations, there's none of that, we would say that that's minor. But on the other hand, if somebody breaks into an organization and steals 50 million records of sensitive <clears throat> client or personally identifiable information, then that would definitely, definitely be a major breach. Now watch, here's the magic, here's the magic. Somebody breaks in to a server. We're still minor. Somebody goes in and accesses five records, still minor. Somebody then starts exfiltrating 10, 20, 30, 40 records a day. It's only when it goes undetected for a significant period of time that it goes from minor to major. So really, the goal of security, and this is huge, it's not to prevent all attacks, which is what many companies think. It's to detect attacks in a timely manner to control the damage. So we now have our definition of cybersecurity, which is all about understanding, managing, and mitigating the risk of our critical data being disclosed, altered, or denied access. And the goal of cybersecurity is to detect attacks in a timely manner to minimize the overall risk to the organization. Or if we wanna say it differently, the goal is to minimize damage to the organization, which is done by timely detection. So really the big area of cybersecurity that organizations and CISOs really need to be focused on is on timely detection. If we can catch the attacks in a quick manner, that's how we win. The problem today is we're still under this mindset that prevent, 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 prevent. We wanna go in and prevent all attacks and then we assume we're preventing all attacks and in cases where we can't prevent, we have little to no detection. So that's first challenge. Second one is there's no trigger for detection in most attacks. Now, if you go back and remember the I love you virus, if you got hit with the I love you virus, it was pretty obvious, right? Everybody was sending I love you messages to each other. So if you came in and you looked at the mail server and you saw more than 100 I love you messages in anyone's inbox, you immediately knew you were attacked and impacted by that virus. Unless, unless you work for a really weird organization where that's normal, right? Now I'm a doctor, right? I'm not a psychologist or a medical doctor, but let me help you out here. If it's normal activity, for you to come into work in the morning and say, oh, you know something? I need to tell my employees that I love them. Oh, I need to tell my boss that I love them. Oh, you know something? I haven't told the CEO how much I love them in two days. I need to do that. There's something a little wrong, right? You need some help, right? That's not normal activity. So many of us just on those early days were trained up that detection was based off of visibility or something that we could see. And yes, with ransomware, we still get that, right? With ransomware, I do agree, it's a little different. Ransomware, we do wanna prevent as much as possible, and we do wanna detect before the ransomware hits. But also with ransomware, we also wanna make sure that we can recover 
quickly have backups so we don't have to pay that ransom. So, so ransomware sort of fits a little differently because that's more monetary gain to the attacker as opposed to data exfiltration or theft. But if we're talking about non-ransomware-based attacks, the big issue today is there's nothing visible. They break in and they start taking small amounts of data out of the organization. Now, here's the trick. How do you make that invisible visible? How do you start getting better optics so you can see that attack vector? So for example, a couple of things. I had an organization that I was working with this week that got hit with a data exfiltration attack and they stole significant amounts of money. And I asked them a few questions. I said, where did the attack come from? And I knew, but I always like to sort of extract the information. They said, well, it came from Europe. And I confirmed the IP address that launched the attack was from Europe. And they basically stole somebody's password to log in to, to steal information and, or steal ultimate monetary transfer information. And I said, your business, where do you mainly do business? And they said, well, we mainly do business within the United States. I said, so anytime there's connections from a foreign country, that is not normal. They said, no. I said, perfect. So what we did is we tuned their outbound systems that whenever there were connections to foreign countries, it would Im immediately flag, set off an alert, and go in and make somebody respond, react, and investigate. So notice what we did there. We were now able to take the invisible and make it visible. We were now able to do that transfer that was needed. Another one of my favorite, favorite tricks. When attackers break into user systems, normally with phishing attacks or others, they're gonna break into a client system. They're then gonna make an encrypted outbound connection that looks like it's going to be SSL out to the internet. So if you're watching this, oh, the user's just surfing the websites, right? They're just doing a normal surfing. But in reality, it's an exfiltration, a command, the control channel, and that's what allows the adversary in. So one of the tricks that we do with our clients is we go in and create crypto-free zones. I call it the last mile is unencrypted. So the local VLANs where your clients sit is unencrypted. But Eric, how do they surf the web? Well, there's a proxy that they can connect to that can then go out and do the SSL so they can still do outbound encryption, but that local last communication is unencrypted and it's heavily segmented, so risks of sniffing or other attacks are very, very low. So now watch what happens. When the user wants to surf to a normal website, they actually go unencrypted to a proxy and then from that proxy, they encrypt outbound. It's all transparent to the user. It's all fine. It's all normal. The adversaries don't know that. So when the adversary sends a phishing attack to that client and they click on it, it infects their system. And now it makes an encrypted outbound connection out to the internet. Now, because that's crypto free zone and we have crypto detectors, all of a sudden we've taken the adversary's biggest strength their ability to blend and hide in with encryption and turned it into their biggest weakness where now they stick out like a sore thumb. So we essentially, by doing crypto free zones, we've made the invisible visible. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. So that's really how you want to think about this problem and this challenge. Now, let me layer in the role of a CISO. So here's the role of a CISO. The, the chief information security officer is going to sit with their secure, their technical team, their security engineers, and they're gonna say, what is one of the biggest risks to our organization? And the way you go in and you look at risk is two things, historical data and comparative data. So you're gonna look historically at your company and then you're going to look at other comparative companies and see what they're challenging with. And you're going to come up and say, the biggest risk we have 
is we don't have visibility to detect attacks in a timely manner. So if an adversary breaks in, we can't detect it in a timely manner to control the damage. So how do we do that? Well, we need to go in and look at the outbound traffic. We have to be able to geolocate IP addresses to see if they're in country, out of country. Also, our outbound behavior is very pattern-based. So we only communicate with a certain number of entities based on the contracts we win. So if all of a sudden there's new connections to a country that haven't existed before, that's an anomaly that we want to investigate and look better at. Also, we are having a lot of clients that are compromised with encrypted channels. So we need to get visibility into the encryption. Notice the CISO's conversation with the security team is fairly technical. Now, you don't have to be super technical, but you need to understand generally what they're talking about, but it's a technical conversation with the team. And then you'll say, okay, so that's the biggest risk, and how do we solve it? So we come up with a lot of options, a lot of solutions, and we'll say, okay, the best option is to outbound proxy all of our traffic with behavioral analytics. So we price it out, and the best option for that is $550,000 solution. Great. So the CISO takes that, goes into their magic lair, right? P people call this my, my special room, right? My magic, magic lair. This is where all the uh, fun happens. And they say, okay, for our organization, what is the probability that we would get attacked and not detect it in a timely manner? And 90%. Now, once again, whether... It's 88 or 93. We don't care. <coughs> Some <coughs> CISOs get so caught up on the little things. Now, yes, if I say 90% and it should have been 10%, that's problematic. That, that's an issue. But if it's 87 or 90, you're just trying to get that general range. And based on the cost of other companies our size, a conservative estimate is $15 million. So then you go to your executives, and you ready for this? All you present is this. One of our top risks is detecting attacks in a timely manner. There's a 90% chance that this could happen. And if it does, it will cost $15 million. And we want $550,000 to mitigate that risk. Mr. and Mrs. Executives, is this a risk you would like us to focus on? I personally think it's the top risk. So just stepping back, what you're really presenting is you're giving nine or 10 risks and you're only presenting four things. What is the risk? Likelihood of occurrence, cost of it occurs, and cost to fix it. And you're prioritizing. You're prioritizing based on the likelihood of occurring and the impact to the organization with the return on investment. So you're doing a prioritization. And then here's the other trick. Always draw a line. So if you're going in and you're saying, here's the top nine risks to our organization today, I recommend we only fix three. So I only recommend that we fix the top three. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you want to show the executives that you understand the business. Because one of the biggest criticisms that executives have of CISOs is they'll spend every last penny on being secure. They don't understand balancing. They want to go in and 100% security, which is not reality. So you're going, listen, I know there's nine risks, but it's only feasible to fix three. The other magic about this is you're speaking their language. Notice, no technical no, I'm not giving them the analytics, the threats, or anything like that. I'm just giving them what they want to know. All executives want to know is the monetary impact to the organization and the return on investment in order to fix or mitigate that. I'll give you a little hint. If you're asking for money from your organization and you're not getting it, it's one simple reason. They do not think it's a good return on investment. It's really that simple because if... They thought they were getting a good return. They would give you the money. I have an extremely high success rate on getting security budgets 
because that's how I present it. And I only present what I call no-brainers. If I have something that has a 90% chance of occurring and could cost the organization $15 million minimal, and I want five fifty dollars to fix it, I call that a no-brainer. I mean, that, that, that's a pretty smart return on investment. Now, I never present to the executives, there's a risk that has a 20% chance of occurring. If it occurs, it will cost us a million dollars and I want 700K to fix it. Uh, too low and the return isn't that, isn't that much. So I, I never go in and ask for those lower things that are questionable. I only do the no-brainers and there's enough of those in the organization. So that is how the CISO layers in with our definition of cybersecurity. The technical discussions with your security engineers, you get a lot of technical details. You might put together a 40 or 50 uh, slide presentation with the threats, the components, the alternatives, all that stuff. But then you have to translate that to one slide that has risk, likelihood of occurrence, cost of it occurs, and cost to fix it. Because that's all they care about. So I can tell you right now, if you're going in to brief your executive team and you're the CISO or playing the role of the CISO either once a year or quarterly, and I'll be nice to you, even though I say one slide, you might want to have some introduction, some general slides, like general high-level threats, just to raise the awareness, not really necessary today. So I'll, I'll give you five slides. But if you have more than five slides, you are not doing what you should. Your chances of success are not very high. And I'll even, with love in my heart, with love in my heart, if you have over 25 slides that you're presenting to your executives, I don't care what you think when you walk out of that meeting. But I will tell you right now, it's not going to be successful. They might smile. They might be nice. They might say, wow, that was really good. But in their minds, they're like, that's not what they wanted. Executives have a CISO so they don't have to worry about that. They don't want to worry about the problems, the details, all the analytics. What they want to know is what do we need to fix? What is the impact to the organization? And what do we need to spend to address it? So really good CISOs are going in and doing that translation piece. So I always go in when I coach, help out or evaluate organizations, I'm going to always ask to sit in on a technical meeting, the CISO with their team. I'm going to ask to sit in on an executive meeting. And just from those two meetings, I can give you all the advice you need. And I just gave you most of it, how to assess and evaluate how well you're doing in those situations. Now, last piece that I want to emphasize when we're really talking about cybersecurity, it's all about balancing, managing, mitigating risk. I, I did a keynote the other day and somebody went in and said, Eric, what if I work in security and I want to be a CISO, but I really don't like risk? Is there a way that I can get around it or not have to deal with it? And, and I sort of smiled. I said, the question you're asking me is this, Eric, I'm afraid of heights. I really don't like flying, but I want to be an airplane pilot. Can you give me any suggestions? Yes. Be an air traffic controller because then you get to work with airplanes, but you're on the ground, right? So it's sort of that thing. So when people go in and say, Eric, I want to do cybersecurity. I don't like risk. My recommendation is work in IT because then you get to work with the tech you get to do the fun, but you get to stay on the ground, right? You don't have to assume those risks, but cybersecurity is all about risk. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. And the way you need to think about it is two, I'm going to give you two different tricks. One trick, that in order to make sure you're aligned with the definition as a CISO, before you spend an hour of your time or a dollar of your budget on anything in the name of security, you should always ask three questions. What is the risk? Is this the highest priority risk? And is our solution the most cost effective? Because one of the problems I see all the time in security is we are often 
taking a solution and looking for a problem. And I get this at least on a weekly basis, sometimes multiple times a day, where I'll get a call from one of our clients going, Eric, we want to go in and purchase this brand new behavioral analytics AI-based system. And it monitors outbound traffic. And, and we've heard such great things about it. What do you think about it? The executives want to get your opinion. And I'll go and I'll be like, what is the risk you're trying to reduce? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Eric, haven't you read up this one, the magic quadrant? This is the number one leading. This is the top cybersecurity product of the year. Okay. What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the risk you're trying to reduce? And it's like we're speaking foreign language. Like, but, but Eric, it's a great, I'm not taking it away. But that's not how you do security. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. You don't find great products and force them in. That's why we have the problem today where you companies have spent millions upon millions of dollars and they're getting breached, they're getting compromised, they're not detecting it for three years because they didn't solve the problem. What you want to do is do what I said earlier. You sit down with your team and you say, what is the biggest risk that we have today? What's the highest priority risk? And then what's the best solution for it? Risk drives your decision matrix, not the solution looking for the problem. And once again, this is something happens inadvertently because people and security engineers love tech, but we always have to go back. What is the risk? Is it the highest priority risk? And is it the most cost-effective way to reduce it? Second, you want to train everyone in your company, everyone who's non-technical in your company to ask additional questions. The question that most business decision makers make today when they're going to buy something is what is the value or benefit? So they go in and say, we want to launch a new e-commerce site. The value or benefit is we can make 30 million more a year. Great, let's do it. Here's the problem. There's always the balance between functionality and security and the rule, just like the rule of gravity. The rule of security is quite simple. Every time you add functionality, you're decreasing security. So you need to train your team, your staff, your non-technical people to ask a second question. What is the risk or exposure? And then is the value worth the risk or exposure? And it's funny because when I work at companies as vCISOs or as a high-level security strategist, I never fight or argue with the vice presidents that want to do things. The problem that many security people do is they get very emotional. They walk into the meeting going, you are not doing this. This is way too big an exposure. This is too big a problem. You're not doing it. I'm going to stop you. That's emotion. Emotions never work. One of my key rules is let data drive decisions, not emotions. So I go in and I say, okay, what is the value or benefit? Why do you want to do this? What is going to be the value or benefit you get out of it? Great. What are the risks or exposures? And most of the time they say, well, I never really thought about those. I'm like, well, let's think about them now. What are some of those risks or exposures? And the trick of a really good CISO, let them come up with it. So he, he, here was a recent interaction. The vice president goes, Eric, I really don't know. That's your job. I said, I, I know it's our job. I said, but what if you did know? What would you say? Eric, I said, I don't know. I know, but just guess. Well, what would be the first thing that comes to mind would be a risk. And, and then what you're doing is you're engaging them so they have ownership of it. And most of the time, they come pretty close. And if not, you can eject in. Then you say, okay, so the value or benefit is this and the risk or exposure is this. This is your decision. Is this a decision you want to make? Is the value worth the risk? Are you willing to accept the risk? Because just so you know, Mr. and Mrs. Vice President, we're presenting this at the next board. And I'm going to tell the executives whether you, that you accepted this risk if we move forward with this project. So the old model where you had all of the authority and I had the responsibility isn't the game anymore. You're owning it. So my role is not 
to be the fall person. It's to educate and make sure you're making good decisions and to make sure the board is aware of those risks. So now if they do decide to move forward, and many times they don't if the risk is high, at that next meeting, I'm gonna go in and say, okay, there was this decision made by this vice president and here's the risk. I just want everyone to be aware of that. So that is really the role of the CISO to educate, inform, and be the advisor. And that's how you're very successful. So if you're a CISO, if you're moving in or want to become a CISO, make sure you're always recognizing the balance. Technical with your security team and high level strategic with the executives. And if you like more help, we just rolled out a CISO cert where it's knowledge transfer. It's six months of group coaching with me and it's a private peer group with other CISOs. If you go to secure-anchor.com slash CISO, I always like giving you free. So that will give you a free ebook on being a CISO. And then if you click through, you can then go in and set up a consultation with someone from my team where we can talk about the CISO cert and see if that's the right match for you. We've already launched this. It's actively running. We've had group coaching, got amazing, amazing feedback. So if you're an existing CISO, want to be a CISO or want to understand the mindset of a CISO, this CISO cert is just for you. Sign up today and I look forward to having you in that next course. I hope you enjoyed this session of Life of a CISO. Until next time, let's work together to make cyberspace a safe place to live, work, and raise a family.